On the evening of September 7th, 2006, my friend Jen and I were driving home from a friend's house near to where the Big Air Radio Observatory used to be. It was somewhere around 10 p.m. near the corner of Cheshire Road and Route 23 between Delaware, Ohio and Lewis Center, Ohio. We were driving down Route 23, heading south toward Lewis Center, when Jen saw a bright light very distant in the sky. We both jokingly said, it's probably a UFO. So we keep driving and we eventually lose sight and forget about the distant object in the sky. Then as we're coming over the precipice of a hill just beyond where the golf course is now, where the telescope once stood there, was an enormous glowing football shaped UFO hanging right above our heads, steadily moving over top of Route 23, heading toward Lewis Center. It was the most frightening and awe-inspiring thing I have ever witnessed. We stopped on the side of the highway and got out of the car. It was the largest thing I've ever seen. I felt like an ant beneath the giant glowing boot. The object looked like it was engulfed in some orangish reddish plasma, almost like what the surface of the sun looks like close up from space. It looked as though it had flames bubbling and churning within it. I tried to take a video with my Motorola Razr, but the phone just would not pick it up at all, even though it had been working just fine and had nearly a full charge. It slowly begins to back away from us a bit and begins floating toward the town of Lewis Center. We follow it back to Lewis Center, where my friends and I watch it for nearly an hour, and eventually it begins to gain altitude in a dizzying display of lights. Then it flashes and blasted away in the blink of an eye, leaving behind a wispy blue teal vapor trail. I found out later on that the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Delaware, Ohio, was where they had received the wow signal in 1977. This object took up a large portion of the visible sky as we came upon it. I'm an airman. I have been trained to observe and identify aircraft I would estimate the object to be the size of an NFL football stadium just floating above the tree line highway and houses and buildings. The object was witnessed by at least five people other than myself. As it was gaining altitude, glowing bluish purplish orbs began to cascade out of the main shaped object, one after the other. Each time they would appear, they would revolve around the main object intensify until all I could see was a spinning blue glow around that main football stadium object. And then in the blink of an eye, it shot off into a flash of light in front of it, like the Enterprise going to warp speed, leaving only a bluish trailing haze behind. The whole experience was the most profound thing to have ever happened to me in my lifetime up till that point. Thank you for hearing my account of what occurred. This story happened three years ago when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there and my favorite thing was to go hiking, although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. 
That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin, so it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned, and nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on and luckily I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly there was a moment of silence in the woods absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back. I started walking faster and guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that, and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life. Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that. So, I'm doing this challenge this year where I'm hiking at a new location every week. Yesterday, I was hiking with my friend in East Texas. He has indigenous blood, and so he's very sensitive to spirits. Anyway, we were a mile and a half into this trail, deep in the woods. It's Tuesday, around noon, so this state park is empty. I start seeing shadows of animals, I'm assuming. First, a white furry animal to my left then a large black shadow, about knee height, of what looked like a boar in front of me. I told my friend, and he just said, oh, that's weird. We walk a couple more steps, and he sees a person ahead, but there's no one there. At least I didn't see it. We brush it off, whatever. Maybe our eyes are playing tricks on us, and when he looks again, he can't see the person either. We move on. And then, all of a sudden, the air around us starts to feel super heavy and dark. Both of our chests start feeling tight, and there's pressure in the air. We both started hearing voices of people chattering on the other side of the wall of trees to our left. I was assuming that it was a campsite, 
because this park has so many campsites everywhere. We turn the corner of the trees and literally no one is there. No campsite either. We both looked at each other and said our own protective prayers and kind of booked it out of there as fast as we could. It felt like we had stepped through a dark curtain or portal of some sort, because when we passed that little river and creek, everything felt lighter. The weight was lifted off our chests and we had to stop and breathe and kind of reassess what had just happened. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this, but it was definitely odd. In 2004, I went to Ireland on the super cheap during this one magical week where there were insanely low fares. That's not the glitch, I'm just nostalgic for that time. While visiting family there, I picked up a Ross O'Carroll Kelly book, not realizing that it was a popular series, and read The Orange Mocha Frappuccino Years in about a day. The first-person narrator uses a Brett Easton Ellis-like voice, where everything is his impressions in real time. I found it hilarious. At one point, we were walking down Grafton Street in Dublin. We walked past a busker and he was playing Don't Look Back in Anger, and he was right on the So Sally Can Wait etc. part as we walked by. Something about how he was singing his heart out, even though it's sort of a cheesy song, impressed me. And I turned to my partner and said, you know, I don't care what anyone else says, I love this song. And she said, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I heard another one doing it earlier. I had been with her, but I hadn't noticed. Later, in a train station news agents, we were selecting supper. It was either a triangle sandwich each or a candy bar each. And another book in the Ross O'Carroll Kelly series, The Teenage Dirtbag Years, to read on the next train. We chose candy and the book. She'd read two pages, then I'd read two, passing it back and forth, perfect for a late evening train where half the people were sleeping and the rest were quiet. She handed me the book with an odd expression at one point, and I looked down to read. It said, So I'm walking down Grafton Street with Sorsha, and we walk past this busker, and he's doing Don't Look Back in Anger, giving it all, so Sally can wait. And I turn to Sorsha, and I say, I don't care what anyone says, that's a great song. And she says, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. My own skepticism says, okay, common street, common buskers, and if you google the title of the song and busker and Grafton, there's a YouTube video of a guy playing that song in 2014. So it is a cliche. And our conversation wasn't at all original, filled with phrases that are really just filler in a way but it still felt really eerie. And honestly, it kind of still does. One night shift, I was dispatched to the VA clinic. As it turned out, a juvenile was in a psychiatric appointment for hearing voices. The kid reportedly heard a pair of hatchets tell him to cut people, so of course, the mom brought him to a doctor. During the appointment, the mother grabbed the hatchets from a bag to show the psychiatrist. As soon as she put them in view, the kid grabbed them and ran out of the building and directly into the cemetery across the street. Thankfully, I was not asked to run alongside K-9 to track this kid, but they did find him without any major incidents. I was, however, tasked with bringing the kid to the centers for evaluation, and while he was in the back of my patrol car, we distracted him with questions while another officer very subtly placed the hatchets in my trunk. It was quiet for a while on the way, and all of a sudden the kid said, Sir... You have my hatchets in the trunk, don't you? I can feel them. 
I didn't verbally respond, but I simply laughed a little. I have never been so freaked out by anything to this day. The centers obviously wouldn't take the hatchets. My sergeant told me not to place them into evidence, and I tried to return them to the mother and she refused to take them. I think we ultimately threw them out, but I don't really know. I just hope they never reunite with that kid ever again. I am a 26-year-old female, and my boyfriend is a 26-year-old male. One day, we went for a big walk around the town that we were living in at the time. It was the middle of the day, probably around 2 p.m., and we were both completely sober. At one point, we were on the side of the road, on one of those lanes where people run and walk, and we saw a female child, around 12 years old if I had to guess, jogging. She was in our lane and coming our way. I remember finding it strange for this child to be out jogging on her own. There was no one else around, and it was a pretty remote area, like a countryside road. But I didn't mention anything to my boyfriend. We were walking side by side, so I walked behind him so that she could pass. I stopped seeing her for a few seconds, but when I saw her again next to me, she was a fully grown woman in her mid-forties. He immediately looks at me before I can say anything in total shock and asks, did you see that? I asked him, did he also see a child turn into a woman? And he said, yeah. He said that she never really left his sight, but as he blinked and looked again, she was no longer a child. We even looked back to confirm and she was still the mid forties woman. Since then, I've been noticing other smaller glitches. I don't know if they were always there and I just didn't pay attention or if that started a whole chain of events. Either way, it was odd. Last year, I was off work for five months because of tumors in my throat. After surgery, I started a new job and my first week back at work, I was cashing through a lady who had two carts full of stuff, so obviously I was helping her for a while. She had her daughter with her, who was probably 12 to 14 and was very high on the autism spectrum. She wasn't nonverbal per se, but she apparently didn't like to talk to strangers at all and generally preferred not to speak whatsoever. Her mom said that there are only three people she ever speaks to, otherwise she ignores everybody. So anyway, she's talking to me the whole time, telling me about the balloon she's getting and how she likes going to stores, which had her mom so happy and surprised she was trying not to cry. The girl was talking to me the entire time, and I was honored. Then, suddenly the girl asks, so how's your throat feeling? Her mom looks at her and says, that's such an odd question to ask someone. Why are you asking her that? The mom laughs and the girl asks me again. I told her it's feeling pretty good and I asked how hers is. She said, mine's good too, but I was worried about you. It was so weird and her mom's like, sorry, I don't know why she's being so odd. I told her, no, it's okay. It's just super ironic because I just had surgery on my throat in April. The girl goes, yeah, I know, that's why I asked. The mom freaked out, thinking her daughter must be sensitive or have a connection to the world that we can't understand. I have no idea what it was, if it was a glitch or an encounter with someone who was psychic, but it was really strange and kind of beautiful. I wondered if maybe she knew me in another dimension, or maybe she's just in tune with another dimension. Maybe time is more fluid to her and she can know these things. Maybe another me met her before my surgery. Maybe it was just coincidence though, who knows. But it was interesting nonetheless.
Over the weekend, I was out of dental floss. I can't stand that. So I looked around for a forgotten roll. I looked in my son's bathroom as well. Nothing. On Tuesday night, my son and I went shopping and I picked up a floss, Tom's, that I had never tried before. I grabbed one because I'm very picky about floss and I was not sure whether or not I would like it. My son then asked if he could get one too and of course I said yes. We go home and my son unpacks the groceries. The two boxes of floss are on the counter. I take mine upstairs, unwrap it, throw the box in the bathroom trash and try it that night. I hated it. Last night I go to floss again and there is now a second one in the drawer. The exact same. I think, well that's weird. Why did my son bring his floss into my bathroom? But I forgot about it because sometimes he uses my bathroom, so whatever. This evening I am cleaning up the kitchen and there's his dental floss on the counter, unopened. I go back upstairs. There are still two flosses in the drawer. They're both completely new except that the one that I have used has of course a slightly smaller roll. The containers are transparent so you can see it. But I had never tried that kind before and I only bought one. So how did I end up with two? I hate to admit it, but I have often read accounts of things like this happening with more skepticism. I always figured that people just forgot that they had two of something because the items are so often insignificant. But here I am in the possession of a mystery floss. I'm kind of honored and excited by the possibilities of what this could mean, but that's my glitch story. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior, with no incidents but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017, whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, first unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room, never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours, was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. 
started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. I was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One, who has never set foot in our apartment prior, commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face.
About 25 years ago, I lived in Texas. Most of my family lived in Utah. My sister called me one afternoon and told me that my niece and her three-year-old daughter were in an accident, but had to be in two different hospitals. The three-year-old, Court, was at a children's hospital. You have to remember, there were no cell phones back then. My sister told me that they were fixing to do surgery on Court for a blood lump behind her eye. My sis was with her as her mom was having surgery at the other hospital. My sis asked me to pray for them both. I was laying on my bed praying, but when I prayed for Court, it felt like I was in her room, and I put my hand on her head while I prayed for her. Jump forward two years, and my family went to Utah for a family reunion. One of the days that I was there, my sister asked if I wanted to see pictures of Court in the hospital, and I did. The sister said that a weird thing happened. Court was sleeping, so sister went to get snacks out of the machine. When she got back to the room, Court was awake. Remember, she was only three. Court asked my sister where Aunt Deb was. That'd be me. She said that I was in Texas. Court said, no, she was in here. She put her hand on my head and she was talking. So, yeah, I guess I really was with her. I don't know if that's some sort of glitch in the matrix sort of thing, but it certainly was memorable. I was camping up in Herber, Arizona with my brothers and my dad. I was 15 or so at the time, and we were deep in the woods, far from most other camps. My brothers and I had our own tent, whilst my dad had a separate one not far off. He likes to give us our privacy while we're camping. We would usually run around a bit at night before going to bed, entering our camp to sleep at about 11 o'clock p.m. One night, we were playing hide-and-seek when we heard a branch snap a few yards from us. We assumed it was an elk or something, since they were pretty common in our area. We would typically go to our tent if we saw one, in hopes of not agitating it. So that's what we did. I called for my youngest brother, who was still hiding, and he revealed himself to be hiding in a branch pile not super far from where the noise originated. We went to the tent anyway, and I decided that since it was already pretty late, we should just go to sleep. The next morning, I went to check the spot for elk prints, since I found them pretty fascinating. Instead, I found large cat prints. I knew they were cat prints because they had the four toe pads and the large center pad as well as no claw marks. I was honestly kind of excited. I had always wanted to see a mountain lion or a bobcat in the wild, but it never happened. Knowing that I was that close to either one was very thrilling. But it then occurred to me that my youngest brother was hiding, separated from us, scarily close to where those prints were found. It occurred to me that if it was a hungry mountain lion and it had taken notice of my six-year-old brother hiding alone, it could have possibly taken the chance. We stopped doing hide and seek at night to avoid those types of situations and we actually set up a roll call system to ensure that everybody was together at night. Now, I know a mountain lion likely wouldn't have done anything had it seen him, but still, the risk felt very real, and I worry that had I not heard it, I could have lost my brother that night. My family has experienced paranormal activity. We were living abroad in Southeast Asia, where spirituality is an integral part of life. We moved into a building on a hill overlooking the jungle when I was three, in an affluent neighborhood of the country's capital city. The building had many apartments and one big house at the bottom of the hill, which is where we lived. When I was five, we were hosting a dinner party, when all of a sudden we hear a bang. A guest bathroom, with doors on opposite sides of the room, had shut and locked itself on both sides. 
My dad had to use a screwdriver to open the lock, and there was nobody and nothing to be found inside. Creepy, right? It gets worse. My auntie came to visit shortly after, and she claimed to see an old woman every night wandering the top floor of the house. An entity my mom told me a few weeks ago she would often see when we lived there. The spirits were not malevolent, but seemed disturbed, apparently. Before we left, we got a monk to come and check the place out. He said that the building had been constructed on top of an old Buddhist burial site, something that is not usually allowed, and the spirits were not able to rest peacefully. Furthermore, he indicated that the banana tree outside of our kitchen was a hub for spirits to hang out, my parents confronted the landlord, who confirmed that the place was haunted. I'm not very spiritual at the moment, but some odd stuff has happened. My parents now always practice feng shui in our house. We moved back to said country a few years later, and we went to visit the place. I was 12 at the time. Sure enough, the building was completely abandoned and the landlord had put it up for sale. Six years ago, my boyfriend at the time, husband now, woke me up sweating and shaking in absolute fear. I asked him what was wrong and he began stuttering and telling me that I would never believe him. He went on to tell me that he was woken up around midnight to this person standing at the end of the bed. Yes, my first thought was sleep paralysis as well, but he sat up and was ready to attack if he needed to. In his head, he heard a voice that wasn't him, telling him that it was okay and that they weren't there for any bad reasons. He said he felt immediately calm from that. He also noted that he was shocked with what a light sleeper I was and that his movements hadn't woken me. This being was unnaturally tall and had to crouch a little due to its height and us having been asleep in the basement. He said that this being reached out for a greeting and again began hearing a voice in his head saying, Hello. Nothing much else happened that night as my husband was frightened. All he remembered at the time was that the last thing he heard from it in his mind was, I'll see you again soon. And then he said it felt as if time had started again, not realizing that it ever felt like it stopped until that point and then he was back in reality, and that's when he woke me. What he thought had only been about a 10 to 15 minute encounter had actually taken over an hour. These visits continued for months, minimum once a week, max three to four times, but my husband got less and less frightened every time. This thing and him built a sort of friendship from what he explained to me. It had a name, but for the life of me, I can't remember what he said it was. It answered any and every question my husband had. I won't go into what those were here. But after a while, it just stopped. He stopped waking me up in the middle of the night or telling me about it the next morning. But the times were always the same. He would be awoken around midnight and they would have discussions about literally anything my husband was curious about. And then he would come back to reality and time would unfreeze again between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., having only felt like the encounter had lasted a short period of time. Once it stopped, though, I can't emphasize enough just how much it stopped. I mean, full stop. It was like for him, it never happened. It's been six years, so I know this is choppy, but it's hard to remember everything with it having been so long ago now. I forgot about it for so long, and I don't know what prompted me to remember it just about a week ago. But now I just can't stop thinking about it, and the oddness of it all, and how it just stopped so suddenly. He's literally never made mention of it ever again, and I've never brought it up to him this last week in fear that he may think I'm crazy. Which, I don't know why that's my fear, 
But part of me thinks if there is a chance he's completely forgotten it, whether it be on his own or something else, he may think I've gone insane. Anyway, if you have any ideas or similar stories, please let me know. I'm trying to figure this all out and what happened to my husband, as it's literally keeping me up at night. Back in October of 1989, my mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. That was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking that we were the only ones on this road and that we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was and that was unsettling to her. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to it. We had separate rooms inside the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then my mother heard what sounded like footsteps and she saw what looked like an outline of a hat through the window there was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us were together and terrified. We thought that this man was going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed that was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep and then were awakened by an owl hooting. My mom could see the owl's eyes, which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. The owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long too. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her. The eyes really unnerved me. Neither of us could sleep. Every noise jarred us awake. It would be like, what's that? Did you hear that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of that hat walking around the general area, and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out by this point, but we also weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were common. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning at that point. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but we left as soon as the sun came up on Saturday. A couple of days later, my mother got a call from the band director. Apparently, the man that we had seen was a mountain man who was a handyman who had been trying to get the power back on for us. He was harmless, but neither the band director or his cousin had told us that he lived out in the woods. Had we known this, we wouldn't have left on Saturday. He was the one that had told the band director that we left a day early. We can laugh about it now. It was a memorable night. That owl still freaks me out, though. One time I was in Russia. It was the first time that I had ever traveled there and I was 19. It was actually Ukraine. I found a bar that I thought was so cool. I met a girl there and we went back to her flat and hooked up. Six years later, I went to the exact same bar. I met another chick and I went home with her. Only it wasn't another chick. It was the same one as before. 
I didn't realize it until I was at her apartment. We hooked up and I left with my hair standing on end. She spoke Ukrainian. I didn't. I don't even know if she recognized me, and it wasn't like I could ask her, so... There was a guy named Nikolai as well, and I met him on both trips too. The first time, I met him at a bar. The other time, I ran into him on some side street one day when I visited for the second time. This is the second biggest city in Crimea, with a population of over 330,000 people. What the hell are the chances of this happening twice? Interesting. This story happened a few years ago. I lived in a building with my daughter, who grew attached to my neighbor's husband, Teddy, as if he were her dad. One day, while talking with my neighbor's wife, my daughter, who was two and a half years old at this time, came running to the door. But rather than running into my neighbor's apartment to go cuddle up Teddy, she froze at the doorway. She told his wife and I that we needed to be quiet, as Teddy was sleeping. Teddy was not sleeping. He was, in fact, sitting on the couch watching TV. Teddy stood up and called for my daughter to come see him. Again, my daughter looked at his wife and I and told us that Teddy was sleeping and that we needed to be quiet. I could see she was getting upset at the fact that we were laughing while telling her that Teddy was awake and wants you to go sit with him. Teddy started approaching the doorway where we were standing my daughter began to cry and ran into our apartment screaming, No, Teddy is sleeping. I could feel the goosebumps running across my body. That same day, my daughter went to a relative's place for a sleepover. I had invited my neighbors to come over for a bit and Teddy came over and explained that he wasn't feeling the best. He said that he was breathing in and out of a paper bag before coming to my apartment. I insisted he go to the hospital to make sure he was all right. On the way, Teddy fell ill and asked to pull over so he could be sick at the side of the road. As he was kneeling beside the car, Teddy suffered a major heart attack and passed away while on the way to the hospital. When the service was held for Teddy, I had such a strong feeling that I had to bring my daughter with me. She brought her favorite blanket with her, of course. When my daughter and I got to the funeral home for the viewing, we were greeted by everyone in Teddy's family. They all knew who my daughter was, as Teddy used to talk about her all the time. I held my daughter close as we walked up to the casket where Teddy laid. My daughter leaned down, almost as if she was going to whisper to him. She then told me, See, Teddy is sleeping and he's really cold. She took her blanket and tucked Teddy in, then looked at me and said how he was warm and happy now. That night, as I sat alone in the living room, my phone began to ring. Four or five rings later and still no name appeared. I quickly answered the phone in the middle of a ring, only to hear the dial tone. The call didn't even show up as an incoming call afterwards. It felt like Teddy had called us to say goodbye. It was so strange that my daughter knew there was something wrong with Teddy before anything even happened. A few months later, we went to go visit my grandmother who was passing away from pancreatic cancer. My daughter refused to enter my grandmother's room. She kept saying how my grandmother was sleeping and that everyone should leave her alone to go sleep. I instantly began to cry. Only four days later, I got the call that my grandmother had passed away in her sleep. Growing up, my family seemed to have a knack for picking haunted houses or haunted locations. Being a military kid was part of that. We got sent to old parts of the bases that we lived in all the time. One was the entire section of houses 
which was haunted by what the wives and my mom deduced was some kind of civil war general. There was one base in particular that we lived on twice in my life. This was the second time when I had studied more of the paranormal, and it was really interesting. It was a young house, one of the newer ones, which had been built in the span between when we had moved from and back to the base. My old childhood home was long gone, but my mom still thinks the general makes his rounds. This house had something else. Both my mom and I have a knack for telling if a house is haunted. To us, it won't feel empty. A haunting, free house feels more like a vacuum of space. I always get the sense that something will peek around the wall at me when I look through the windows, if something's there. At the house we lived in, I would always get the sensation that something was standing behind me. Like in the horror movies, where you see the ghost behind the character, but then they stand up and it's gone. For fun, I called the ghost Johnny, as in Johnny Rebel, seeing as how it was Virginia and probably another Civil War ghost. One night, I was laying in bed, and I heard what sounded like pacing up in the attic area. It was frantic pacing, like someone was unhappy with something or panicked. The activity was ramping up a little, so my mom and I did a mini investigation. We opened up the attic door, and my mom stuck her head up there. Immediately, she called down to my dad, asking if he had put the Christmas decorations up there. He did, and we both shared a knowing look. She took the decorations down, and the activity immediately settled down. When my dad was promoted, we were moved to a new house just a short walk from the old one. My mom came to me one day and said that she had had a dream. In her dream, it was the dining room from the previous house, and a little boy was sitting at the table, dressed in 18th century clothing. She said he looked up and had blood coming from his eyes and mouth. She started yelling at him to leave. She said that he looked startled and said, but I don't want to leave. We both agreed it was an odd dream. And as I thought about it, I looked up yellow fever, knowing that it was a sickness prominent during that time frame that the boy looked to be a part of. I didn't think it would turn up what I found. Not only had there been a yellow fever epidemic in that area in the 1800s, but there were two stages of the disease. If you got the second stage, you would bleed from the eyes and mouth. I told this to my mom, and we came to the conclusion that Johnny was probably not a Civil War soldier, but a little boy who died of a terrible disease and just wanted his space to be left alone. We used to have a mimic when I was in college. People would hear or see me or my husband when we weren't there. After moving to our apartment in another state, we didn't have many experiences and assumed that it had stayed with the house. A couple of months ago, we moved into a different apartment and we've been having some odd occurrences. Things are moved around and reorganized. We hear or see each other when we aren't there stuff we used to see in our old place. The mimic has always been kind of helpful, so we don't really mind having it around. The first weekend in our new place, my shoes were organized without either of us touching them. Stuff I needed has popped up on the counters in plain sight. This morning, I was brushing my teeth as my husband was making coffee, and I heard him say, we're almost out of milk. I assumed he meant creamer since we don't have regular milk in the house and he was making coffee. When I went to make a cup, surely enough, we were almost out of creamer. I went into the home office and asked my husband if he had meant creamer before, when I heard him say we were low on milk, and he just gave me this weird face. He insisted that he never said that. My friendly neighborhood mimic, I guess, just wanted me to be prepared when I was going to make a cup of coffee.
This is something my grandma told me. It was summer in the late 70s. My grandpa was stationed in California while my grandma, mom, and uncle were living in Oklahoma. My grandma and great-grandpa decided to take a trip with the kids to visit my grandpa in California. They made it there safely and had a really good time while they were there. The morning they left, my great-grandpa called my great-grandma back in Oklahoma to let her know they were about to hit the road. It was about a three-day drive, taking the scenic route and stopping to sleep at rest stops. It was a normal trip, my mom and her younger brother playing in the back seat. They had made it to New Mexico and were only about eight hours away from home, when they were suddenly hit by a freak blizzard. They could barely see where they were going, so they were driving slowly and looking for somewhere safe to pull over and wait out the storm. They saw a bunch of lights on the road coming toward them, and assuming it was emergency vehicles, they pulled over to the side of the road to let them pass. The next thing they know, an officer tapped on their window, waking them all up and asking them to move along. They were confused, but just kind of brushed it off, thinking maybe they had just decided to sleep where they were rather than continue driving through the blizzard. Except, when they started to look around, there was no snow. There was no sign whatsoever of any storm. They stopped at a gas station, and my grandma said something to the attendant about the storm. He didn't say anything, but looked at her like she was nuts. They got back on the road and were home that evening. When they got home, my great-grandma was in a full panic, asking them what the hell happened to them. Apparently, it had been 10 days since my great-grandpa called to say they were heading home. They all have an entire week of their life missing, and they have no idea what happened to them or where they were during that week. This is my mom's story from when she was a teenager in Malaysia during the 60s. She was the oldest girl in the family with three older brothers and five younger sisters. All the brothers, my uncles, weren't there the night this happened. She doesn't remember where they went. It was in durian season and a school holiday, so my grandfather took them back home to my great-grandfather's house in the Malacca countryside. His house is located on a hillside, surrounded by forest, and it's the only house up on that hill. Our nearest neighbor is about a half a mile down the road. She and her younger siblings, along with her cousins, were looking for fresh, ripe durians that had fallen from the trees at night in their grandfather's orchard, just down the hill. They don't have any flashlights, so they tie up a bunch of dry coconut leaves together to make a huge torch. There are around 15 durian trees, but the oldest and biggest tree is about 200 meters, 650 feet, down from the house. It has a long and large horizontal branch that hangs out about six feet from the ground. The orchard was surrounded by palms, tall forest trees, and a huge bamboo forest, so it's quite dark during the daytime, much worse at night. During a full moon, the huge tree canopy only lets some of the moonlight pass through. It creates quite an eerie atmosphere, especially when there's fog. Anyway, they started searching for fallen fruits after lighting their huge torch. The fire was quite big, and it illuminated a large area around them. Her sisters and cousins, being kids, understandably excited about the prospect of finding fresh durians, were giggling and running around, chasing each other while searching for the fruits. They found a few fresh durians, but decided to search for more farther down the orchard, toward that big tree with the horizontal branch. My mother was standing right under that branch, her left hand holding up the huge fiery torch, and her right hand holding a couple of durians. None of them were looking up. They kept looking on the ground and searching. She was holding the torch high above her head, right next to that horizontal branch, when it happens. You know the sound you make when you're trying to blow out a fire on a lighted match or a candle in one strong, quick blow? 
That's exactly the sound that they heard from right above the horizontal branch on that tree. That's when the torch, with its huge fire, was extinguished. No human could extinguish that large fire in a single breath. And there was no chance that it was caused by a strong wind. The orchards were surrounded by thick forest, and there was no wind that night. Immediately when the torch went out, they all scampered uphill toward the house, dropping all the fruits that they had found behind them. They didn't even have time to cry. This intense feeling of fear and panic overwhelmed all of them, kicking up their adrenaline. They ran with all their might, and everybody squeezed through the kitchen door. My mother then slammed the door closed and immediately locked it. They all fell in a pile on the kitchen floor, hyperventilating, and then they started to cry. The commotion surprised everyone in the house. My great-grandfather, upon learning about what had happened, immediately recited some prayers and burned some incense to purify and shield the house to prevent whatever that thing on the tree was from entering. None of them could sleep that night. My mother told me that that was the last time they ever went out at night to search for durians. And this is also why they never let us go down to the orchard at night. This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I had just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like we disturbed the demon or spirit when we went in there. Everyone who went up there had a bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember me laying in bed everything a silent stone. I was peacefully watching TV, and then I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up and slowly check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally was persuaded to go and check. It sounded like at least five people whispering. But as soon as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing there was all my clothes, but they were swaying back and forth. And it couldn't have been the wind or anything like that, because I checked if the closet doors had made a little wind and the clothes didn't move. This went on every night for about two weeks. Then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, things being out of place, and things like that didn't quit. After a while, we got used to it, but that's when things just got worse. This one night, I had to take a shower, and I went to bed as usual. No whispers or anything, I just went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog at first, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described it as if it looked like something went inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but things just didn't stop. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store. And when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, thinking she was lost or something, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in too, so I'm not sure how a little girl would have gotten there. Then after that, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed and we eventually moved out. I don't know what it was, a demon, a lost spirit, I'm just glad I don't have to deal with it anymore. This just happened yesterday. 
so it's fresh in my mind. I'm not quite sure what to think of it, because it was just so bizarre and unbelievable. Maybe I was just sleep deprived. So last night at maybe 2300, I was walking around my block. My town is relatively safe, so I didn't feel in danger. Plus, it was a pretty night. I had been walking for around five minutes when a pale woman with blonde hair and a white dress caught my eye from across the street. She was about my height and looked to be around my age, too. I didn't actually pay attention to her after I first noticed her. While I circled the block again, she was on the same street, a couple of feet in front of me. She was standing on the curb, staring at the cars passing by. It was a main road, so even that late, people were still driving on it. I said hello to her and she turned her gaze toward me. I couldn't see her face super well, but from what I think I saw, she had no pupils, no color in her eyes. She just stared at me. After a while, I asked if she was okay. She didn't respond and simply pointed at the road. I was really confused and I didn't understand. Right then, a red car started coming down the road. She stepped into the road and the car slammed into her. It was a bloody mess. The driver immediately stopped and jumped out. It was a man in his mid-twenties. We both spoke about it, freaking out. He called the police, and I went around the car to see the state of the girl. But once I circled around the car, she was gone. Not as in dead, gone, as in she wasn't there at all. The blood on the road was gone too, but not gone from his car. After the police arrived, they concluded that it was some kind of big hoax. A hoax by some kid who didn't know what they were talking about, and some guy who just went along with it. The blood on the truck was brought into investigation, only to be found as paint. Nothing else was put up about it. I'm still not sure if what happened was real. It felt so real, but I don't believe in the paranormal. I don't know what it was. Was it some kind of waking dream? I remember it like it was a real event. I feel like I can't leave the house now. I don't understand anything, and I kind of feel like I'm going crazy. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? About eight years ago, when I was 13, I was up until 3 a.m. playing Xbox online, as you do. I remember feeling a little peckish, and I wanted some late night cereal, so I finished my game and went to go grab something to munch on. I turned on the hall lights and checked on my little brother, who was nine at the time, and my little sister, who was five. Being the oldest sibling, it was just something I would do. They were both fast asleep. As I got to the top of the staircase, I started to hear a little girl talking to herself. It completely creeped me out, but I thought maybe it was my sister sleep talking. But then it was even clearer, and I could really hear the sound of this girl's voice, and it was not my sister. I heard the voice coming from downstairs, and I got this horrible, sickening feeling inside my stomach. I got on my knees on the top of the staircase and put my head down the stairs a little to hear the voice clearer. Then I figured that the voice was coming from the kitchen. Maybe she sensed I was there, because after that, when I tried to hear her even clearer, she laughed and I heard footsteps run off. I absolutely freaked out and ran into my mom and dad's room, telling them what had happened, but they both just told me to go back to bed. Needless to say, I did not get that bowl of cereal or sleep much that night. It was only a few weeks ago, now that I'm 21, that my mom has told me about the little girl who lives in our house. She says she feels her presence every now and then, mainly at the bottom of the stairs, which makes sense, as our two dogs now and our old dog used to stare up the staircase at nothing 
and sometimes bark like crazy. To this day, when I watch TV, I sometimes feel her looking at me from the stairs, although I've never heard or experienced anything quite like I did when I was younger. I'm a bit mystified by what happened to me. I was out with a friend and the two of us were descending downhill from an old fortress. Just as the sun came down behind the mountain, everything went completely and utterly silent. One minute the birds were singing and chirping like crazy, and the next, dead silence. It was like somebody flipped a switch. You could only hear the wind rustling the dead and falling leaves. It took us a few moments to really notice the silence, before the silence almost became loud and noticeable. We kind of looked at each other and stopped to listen for a bit, and after a while, something that sounded like a flute could be heard coming from farther downhill. Every minute or so we'd hear it, five to six second intervals, nothing complex. It lasted maybe 10 minutes, and then it suddenly stopped. After a while, we could hear birds and bugs and small animals again, even cars in the distance. But during those minutes we heard the flute, everything went deadly silent. The nearest wolves and bears and things like that are nowhere in this area, and there was just that odd music in the silence. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out what in the world we experienced. It was Christmas Eve of 2014 at about 8 o'clock p.m. I was driving to my boss's house to drop off a set of keys when an orange orb flew over my car. I immediately pulled over to the side and got out of the car and looked up to see a dozen orange orbs the size of cantaloupes. They were 5 to 10 feet above me. They seemed to have heartbeats and would control their brightness pulsing. I was trying to see if they were solid, but they weren't, which was odd because they were definitely intelligent. They were completely silent and seemed to have their own personalities. Some stood still, while others whizzed by playfully. When I would stare at one, it would blink, I guess to let me know that it saw me. I wasn't scared. I was actually euphoric and very excited to be a witness to this. They seemed friendly to me. I watched them for about three to five minutes until they slowly flew away and each one disappeared. I was amazed and I even stopped at a church that was close by to ask if anybody had seen these things. They said no. To this day, it was one of the most bizarre and profound experiences of my life. Also, the next day, my eyes were burning red and sore. I later found out that there were many other sightings all over the US on the same night. In 2016, my girlfriend and I decided to go on our first vacation together. We booked a three-night stay at the Belmont Hotel, not its real name, which was a historic hotel in the old part of the city we were in. It was an elegant manor-style home from the 1850s, and parts of the property looked from that period. Massive staircases, a parlor room, and original furniture throughout. Our first day, we did the usual touristy stuff. Exhausted, we settled into our room and crashed for the evening. Our first night, we barely slept. My girlfriend and I were both uncomfortable sleeping in the room, and we felt like somebody was watching us. A few hours later, at about 3 a.m., we were abruptly awoken to a very loud sound coming from above our room. 
It sounded like somebody was pulling or pushing a large piece of furniture, that stuttering of wood on wood and the creaking. It was unbearably loud. This went on ad nauseum for a while. We were totally awake, thinking that somebody was working upstairs, like a staff member moving furniture or rearranging the room. We were both dumbfounded, sitting upright in our beds waiting for this to end. The second day, more touristy stuff. We didn't really think much about the previous night. The second night, we were zonked out and ready to sleep early. This night was strangely similar. We woke up around the same time to the exact same creaking and stuttering of furniture, or something being moved around above us. It eventually stopped like the day before, and we managed to fall back asleep. The next thing I remember is my girlfriend waking me up abruptly, saying, What are you doing? I awoke, standing in the middle of the room in the dark, unpacking my bag angrily and throwing our clothes into the air. I snapped at her for asking me what I was doing and for interrupting me. I was frustrated and agitated upon waking. Suddenly, I vaguely remembered what I was doing, almost like a dream upon waking when you try to hang on to that dream. I sat on the bed and I explained that I was looking for a key in the room, and I remembered wandering around the room desperately, searching the walls, the floors, the furniture with my hands in the dark. I was getting more disturbed the more I explained this to my girlfriend. The idea that I was alone in this dark hotel room doing this really frightened me because I had no control. Needless to say, we decided to call it early and head home and end our vacation. We drove the full four-hour drive home that night in pitch darkness and fog. I called the hotel that morning to check out early. Speaking with the front desk, I mentioned the loud noises coming from above our room. She replied, There is no room above yours. It's an attic space, and no staff would have been in there at that time. I mentioned that it sounded like somebody was dragging furniture on hardwood. She said that there was a lot of furniture up there, but that no staff member would have been there. I asked her if the hotel was haunted, and after a moment, she responded reluctantly that she's not sure, but she has heard other similar stories. A while back, the night before the last full moon, I went outside past midnight. It was pretty dead quiet outside, especially since it was during a big cold snap. I was out for fresh air when I heard the sound of chains and ice crackling in the near distance. I got a creepy vibe, but I tried to ignore it. There were no cars or people out that I could hear or see. Suddenly, I heard and saw my backyard gate creak open. I felt this intense presence as I heard footsteps quickly approach me. I ran inside and closed the door before it got to me. I couldn't see anything, but I did get a picture in my mind of a being with antlers or horns or something, not clear enough to say for sure but it felt like it was speaking to me telepathically. I could tell that it read heavy energies and it told me don't carry their burdens and that my heart was lighter than I believed to keep it pure and I'd have nothing to worry about. I asked it about how to heal or let go of these pains and frustrations that I'd been having with trying to move on and let go of an ex toxic friend they told me that they didn't do that kind of work, and left. I got the feeling that they did heavier work. It didn't seem to have any harmful intent. There was a wisdom to it, but not something or someone that I would want to cross paths with if I were up to no good. I live in central Canada, if that helps, the prairies. I can't seem to find anything specific online about any deities or entities that match. 
There's Krampus, but I feel like I highly doubt that that was it. It was way past Christmas. And I don't think it's tied to Canada at all either. The words mentioning my heart being lighter than I believed made me think of Anubis, but I still don't think that it was Anubis either. I'm not really sure what I encountered that night, but it was really fascinating. Not too long ago, maybe four years, I was walking with my family on this trail. We did this often just as a family activity, and this time we decided to walk along a new trail. After we walked for a bit, my father saw some rubble in the distance and said we should go check it out. We walked up to it and it appeared to be stone buildings, very decayed and barely intact. Just half of one of each walls was standing enough to tell what the building could have been, but nowhere near an intact structure. But then off in the distance a little bit, I noticed a staircase. The same type of stone, but somehow completely different. This staircase looked as though it hadn't aged at all. Completely disregarding this, I stepped on them and I walked up to the top. I looked around and saw nothing else. I told my father to come up but he said that I should come down. And then I remember feeling this weird feeling. I was filled with dread mingled with a feeling of being lost. I came down and we walked a little bit more before leaving. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned this to my friends and they insisted that we go to check it out. I brought them to the ruins, but they were gone. I know I went to the exact spot but it was like they never existed. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear, all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. 
they constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the OZ bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here. And I'm still at least two miles from civilization. And that civilization, in reality, was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. 
unique to this place, unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my co-worker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, Without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. This is not necessarily super creepy, but creepy enough in a sense that it gave me some peace. And I think maybe my grandma some peace too. It was around Christmas time. I was staying with my then boyfriend, and I was staying over at his house, sleeping down in the basement. That night, I had a really strange dream. I was in a house, and there was a party going on. When I was there, an older man approached me. He knew my name, and I felt like I knew him. But I also knew that I had never met him in person, and I couldn't place him. He was really sweet, very nice, and we just kind of stared at each other. It was like we were having a conversation, but we weren't. It was kind of strange. I felt so comfortable with him as a person does with a close family member. Finally, he said, Hey, tell your Nana I say hi, and I love her. And I was like, Oh, okay, sure. And then I woke up. I told my grandma about it the next day, and gave her some information on what the guy looked like. She started crying on the phone, saying, You just saw my dad. I guess he had died a few years before I was born and I'm actually named after him partially. My middle name is Joe. Turns out his birthday was on December 31st. I believe he would have been 90 something. And the dream that I had was also on December 31st. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. 
A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend, but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard, while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced, and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch. After those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds, and then a loud bang came, then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door it was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment, I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer. Another cliche thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal, except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, the night of the event, there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us because I had been living there for about three years and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. 
but why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving, and it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much. The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. Personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on, so why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt along with my mother have had many unexplained experiences and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. My boyfriend and I went to visit family in New York, and we stayed at the Hyatt Grand Central. I believe that there's a paranormal world due to having experiences in my childhood home. I also know that Grand Central Station is known to be haunted. Our hotel was connected to the station, but I didn't think anything of it. Of course, ghosts can't travel from building to building, or so I thought. It was our last night and I was asleep. I woke up to the sound of the hotel doorknob moving as if somebody was trying to come in, but I never heard the door open. I closed my eyes and said to myself, you're just imagining things. I heard it again and I looked up. When you walk into this room, there's this long walkway and the bed is to the right. I looked up and I swear to Jesus and all of his disciples that I saw a man, a tall figure with black eyes, peek around the corner. I screamed, somebody's in here. As soon as I screamed, he disappeared, and I heard the doorknob again, as if he had walked out. My boyfriend jumps out of bed, butt naked, and runs around the room. The door was locked, so I don't believe it was an actual person because hotel doors are heavy and you can usually hear when somebody opens and closes them. Of course, you can't lock the door behind yourself. I only heard the doorknob move, but never heard the door, so we figured it was a spirit. I later found out that there are tunnels from the hotel to the train station 
and many people have died in the tunnels. Beautiful hotel, but I will not be returning. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was unfortunately all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place 
She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill. Drink some coffee, hang out, and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. This story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, and candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town and randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working. Not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tej, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tej told me that he had heard a rumor of some weird lights out in an old cemetery just outside of town. Tej was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started to back up what Tej was saying, so I told them that as soon as I had finished up cleaning the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at around 1am. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck, so the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck, so I parked the truck right in front of it. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out at this point, I didn't really trust Tej, and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at two o'clock in the morning. So I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes pass, and we're starting to see these fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could even see them in the woods around us. I asked Tej if those were the lights he saw, but before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill, and that's when I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us, and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been from them moving around in the woods where trees were blocking the light. I started freaking out, and I was screaming at both of them, and I told them that if they were playing some kind of elaborate prank on me, it wasn't funny and that I was leaving. I tried to start the truck, but it turned once and then died. Tej had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. 
At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas while turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew I needed to get us out of there. Tej was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted this thing to get closer, but I wasn't hearing it. I was shaking and I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we came. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tej and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer searching to see if I could find any explanation for what I had seen. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? No idea. It all seemed like BS to me, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her out there, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge, walked up the hill, and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on tombstones, flashlights, footprints, anything, but we didn't see a thing that could explain what I saw the night before. The cemetery was way too far away from any major road for it to have been car lights. I still don't know what we saw that night and I get goosebumps every time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens. Back in 2004 to 2005, I worked in a group home supporting people experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mostly worked nights, and since the clients in that home were pretty chill, we were always allowed to sleep a few hours before getting our clients up and ready for the day. I usually slept on the couch, with my shoes on the floor next to the couch, and my cell phone, keys, etc. either on the table, in my shoe, or next to my shoes. One morning, I got up and started getting things ready for the day. I had left my phone on the floor in front of the couch. I was a few feet away from the couch, looked over, and I saw a hand reach out from under the couch, grab my cell phone, and start to pull it under the couch. I lunged down and grabbed my phone with one hand. I pulled my phone back toward me, but I felt the resistance of whatever had a hold of my phone pulling it away from me under the couch. After a moment of tug of war, I pulled my phone from the grasp of the hand and it disappeared back under the couch. I was really freaked out and even to this day I get chills thinking about or relating this experience. The hand was obviously thin to be able to slide in and out from underneath that couch. From the wrist to the tip of the fingers was maybe three to four inches. The skin on this hand was gray and wrinkled, almost shriveled, and the nails, the fingernails were long, pointed, thick and yellow. I have no idea what it was that tried to take my phone, or why it wanted it, but it creeps me out to this day. When I was seven, I woke up in the middle of the night to steal some biscuits from the kitchen. Our kitchen is right beside our conservatory, which has a big open window that allows you to glance out into the garden. While eating, I heard some chatter from outside. Curious, I went to go peer outside the window. I saw three little men in red pointy hats outside in my garden bickering amongst themselves in a strange language I've never heard of before or after. 
I was so stricken with terror that I didn't speak. I ran to my parents' bedroom to tell them about the intruders. My dad was reluctant to believe me, but he could see that I was obviously shaken up by something and came downstairs to investigate. They must have heard us coming, because by the time we'd gotten to the conservatory, they'd already pegged it and were running through the back gate. My dad got a glimpse of them too, but he only saw their red pointy hats. I've never seen him look so scared before, or in such complete disbelief. I'm still completely baffled by the whole thing. In this story, user Mischievous Dagger tells about the haunted house they lived in when they were growing up. Growing up, I always had to move from one place to another. There was this apartment in particular that terrified me. I was about seven or eight when weird stuff started happening. Basically, things would go missing, things got moved, I would hear footsteps in the hallways. Once, my dad heard somebody or something small running. He thought it was my sister and called her, but nobody answered. When he came to check on me and my sister, he found us both fast asleep. We always shared a room. One time, my mom baked a cake at night. I don't know why she decided to bake it at night, but she did. At night, we heard muffled chewing sounds. It wasn't my parents, as they had gone to sleep hours before that. Their room was in front of mine, and I would have seen them coming out. The next day, we found half of the cake gone. Another time, my dad bought a GPS. He was very happy with it and put it on the table. The next day, it was gone. My sister and I didn't touch it because my dad was very strict, and we used to be scared of what would happen if we touched his things. My mom was home all day, but she's a busy woman and couldn't have cared less about a GPS. It was gone for a week. Then one day, my dad called my mom asking her where she'd found it. It was right where he had left it, and my mom had never touched it. This freaks me out the most, though. I had a saint. A paper with a saint on it. We call it a saint here. No matter how many times I got rid of the saint, it always came back. I ripped it apart so many times, I shredded it, but it always returned whole to my desk. I no longer live in that house, but every time I walk by it, I get this feeling of dread. In this tale, Reddit user expert maybe 5106 tells an eclectic mix of tales that happened at their haunted house. Here are the stories. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I have so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this story to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the most significant things to take place here over the years. To preface this, I'd like to say that I'm a 21-year-old female, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both of my parents, four cats, and a dog. Now it's just myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she'd passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they are attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell, 
and a calming feel that comes along with her. We also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them, because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits, or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine, if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs, and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist-type activity. That being said, on to some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks me about it. So, one day I was probably around 14. I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in. But I also didn't want to just send a black screen. So I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started to struggle to focus. It wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, of course, but I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worst. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest or something come over. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to Wicca. It seemed like BS to me at first, but this man had told me that there are ways that we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but as I understood it, a candle alone equals good, and a candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into that, it can open a portal to darker dimensions. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking that it was BS. But then I remembered... Just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom, I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle darn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and get rid of it or remove it, whatever I had to do. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take this Wicca stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little bit less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say that I was possessed for a few hours. But for me, it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me that I did things that I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house, the same room that I got scratched in. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later. So what I'm telling you from here until I snapped out of it was told to me by witnesses. My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights began to flicker in the bathroom, and I just stopped talking, and it was like I was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked me what was wrong, and I responded with, I can't leave. There's someone blocking the door. Right away she knew something wasn't right, and told me to just go out. 
but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her that she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere. Upstairs, main floor, basement, every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, she saw me standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked me where I'd come from and that she'd been looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily that it wasn't even like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom and she said, no, you weren't. I just looked in there. Once she said that, she said that I completely changed and she could tell that it like enraged me or something. I told her that she needed to leave and apparently I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14 year old girl talking to one of her best friends, that definitely wasn't like me. She tried to argue over leaving, but apparently the more she did, the more aggressive I got about telling her to get out. So out of fear, she left and she and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed and no one knows what I was up to. But I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered, you know, the portal mirror, with the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared or stop running or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe it is this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except that I didn't remember falling asleep or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we did a little bit more research and we talked with the Wiccan priest. I ended up finding out that I had an attachment that I created, like I said, with that Ouija board at 11, and then I just strengthened it with the mirror portal. I was blessed and so was the house, and for a long time things were better. My house, though, is still extremely haunted, and I could share a lot more about it. Little things here and there, like hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs, my dog not being willing to go in the basement, hearing voices being touched, objects moving, stuff like that. But this story is about the craziest stuff that's happened to me. This occurred about three years ago. I had a position as a buyer and as such would receive tons of cold calls and emails from people trying to get our company to try their products for resale. Also important, our company had a digital phone system like VoIP. There was one central number and it followed a phone tree to multiple offices via internet connection. Voicemails were available on our big office phones but the recording would also be sent to our emails. So one day I received a voicemail from a phone number I recognized as someone who had been attempting to get a hold of me to sell me their products. Oddly, the voicemail was something like 15 minutes long. Curious, I began to listen to it. The message begins with just static and the sound of rustling. Seems like a classic butt dial, or maybe they forgot to hang up when the voicemail clicked on. I fast forwarded the message just to see if anything was ever heard. And yes, suddenly a clear voice. They're having a one-sided conversation. I think, ooh, these can be fun sometimes. Except the one-sided conversation is clearly with me. The person on the phone is referencing my then recent maternity leave, our company by name, a few other pretty identifying details that currently escape me. They'd stop speaking and it would be blank air. And then they would answer a pertinent question that I would have asked in that kind of a conversation, clearly speaking to me. But I never spoke to this company or this person. I did receive additional emails from them later that were clearly initial attempts at communication and not a follow-up conversation. I checked with coworkers in case somehow, somewhere, their conversation got picked up in my voicemail 
and nope. Co-workers and husband were equally confused, but with zero explanation, we all just had to move on. I'm from the small country of Bangladesh, and whenever I go to visit, my cousins and family members like telling us stories about all the paranormal things that they've encountered or heard about. They don't have any physical evidence, but they've all claimed to have had experiences with the paranormal. One of the stories I've commonly heard about are old trees, usually willows, sometimes banana trees, around lakes or rivers. It's believed that when a young maiden dies near the tree, their soul resides there. The deaths are usually drowning, unaliving someone else, or unaliving oneself. It is only during dawn when she said that the souls start to bother people. She said that hauntings behave like sirens do. To men who pass by a haunted tree during the dawn hours, they appear as very beautiful women. To women, they appear as a sad, lost little girl. When someone approaches them, they stay in their form. But whenever the person is at arm's length, they become demonic and angry and try to harm the person. Some people even claim to be possessed by those souls and get exorcisms performed. A lot of my family members are skeptical about the stories and don't believe them. But if they're outside around dawn, I'll watch them go out of their way to go all the way around an old tree near a lake or a river. So, I don't know how much they really don't believe in. I've never seen or experienced this, but I've had several people tell me the same story, independent of one another. So, I thought it would be interesting to share. I was talking to an old friend about maybe going on an impromptu ghost hunt this month, and during the conversation, we reminisced about some of the creepy stuff that we had experienced over the years. We remembered a particular event that stuck out with us, and it's one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. The story begins with my friend, who we'll call T, and myself searching a hidden attic-like space in his house for a supposed stash of money allegedly left there by a previous tenant. Truth be told, I think that was just a story his mom told us to get us off the Xbox for a while. It was the heyday of Halo, and she was probably just sick of us sitting in front of his TV. But whether or not the story she told us was true, we wound up in this small and low-ceilinged attic space, which could only be accessed by a tiny door hidden in the wooden panels in the wall. We'd known about the door for a while, but had never bothered to go in, mostly because the door seemed like it had been sealed somehow, and we couldn't be bothered with actually using our brains and finding something to pry it open. But the prospect of finding free money in a dusty old room was too much, so we called a few friends to come help search the place. And after a few pries with a putty knife and a flathead screwdriver, we cracked the door open and began to explore. At first, it didn't seem like much was in there. Some old clothes and papers scattered about, and a desk in the corner. But through the gloom and dust, we could see something against the far wall, which turned out to be a very old cot of some kind. It was either busted in half or was meant to fold in half, but either way it was folded over on itself, and we could see something covered in cloth and sandwiched between the two halves. Of course, we wouldn't be good treasure hunters if we didn't look at the covered thing, so we start making our way over to the folded cot. I take a few steps forward, and my foot goes right through the floor like it's made of wet paper. Luckily, though T was right behind me, he had very quick reflexes. His hand shot out and grabbed the back of my shirt to keep me from falling forward, and probably all the way through the floor. We took a second to laugh at the situation, and realized that we should probably stick to the sides of the room 
as the center was most likely the weakest and probably the most likely to collapse under our weight. So we tiptoe all the way around the wall of the room until we get to the cot where we start unfolding it to get to the covered thing. This is where things got strange. As soon as we touched the cot, the room got very cold, which was odd because we were in an attic in mid-July. At the time, we thought nothing of it. We were certain we had found the stash We were moments away from being rich. So we unfold the cot, which took all of our combined strength from how rusted and decrepit the thing was. Honestly, I was surprised it didn't just crumble to dust at the first touch. Finally, we got it unfolded and found that it was, in fact, a decently sized wall mirror that had been wrapped in a sheet or a thin blanket. As soon as we uncovered the mirror, the tiny door that we had come through slowly swung shut. Again, we didn't think anything about it. Must have been a gust of air or something. We were a little disheartened by the lack of money, but T's mom had sent us in there with her camera to take pictures of anything interesting so she could see what was inside since she wouldn't be going in herself. So we snap a couple of pictures of the mirror, the cot, and the random debris lying around. Now here it's important to note that the mirror's reflective surface was absolutely caked with dust. You could barely tell that the mirror was a mirror, the dust was so thick. Yet the base of the mirror, which looked and felt like it was made of some sort of ceramic, was practically pristine. When I say the base, I mean the part of the mirror in which the reflective surface was set, not the actual bottom of the mirror. I found that to be very odd, as the whole mirror had been covered by the sheet. So why would any of it be dusty at all, let alone just a specific part like that? So we snap the pictures and are about to call it quits when we hear the dogs barking downstairs. That usually meant that somebody was at the door, so we carefully make our way along the walls and out of the room to head downstairs. It turned out to be our friend, who we'll call B, who had come to help us search for the supposed stash. After we told her about the attic room, she wanted to see it for herself. So naturally, we took her up and showed her the tiny door. Before we even set foot into the room, we told her about the crappy floor and to only walk along the walls. Of course, she either didn't take us seriously, or she just didn't understand what we had said. Because she takes a couple of steps toward the cot and falls almost all the way through the floor, practically right through the small hole that I had created earlier. So she's sitting there with her upper body still in the attic, and her legs dangling down through the ceiling of the kitchen. It was at this moment that I heard one of the most hilarious sentences I've ever heard. Through the now large hole in the floor, we could hear T's mom on the phone with someone when she said in a very flat and nonchalant tone, I have to go now, there are children falling through my ceiling. So we get V out of the floor and have a good laugh about the situation. And once we're sure she was okay, we all agreed it was probably best to just leave the room alone before we caused any more damage. We get out and all the way downstairs when T pipes up that he'd forgotten the camera and a flashlight in there. So I agreed to go back in with him to grab them. We thought it wouldn't take but a second as he remembered setting them both down on the floor close to the hole when we were helping B get out. But when we got there, we were a little confused. We couldn't see the camera or the flashlight anywhere. We looked all over the floor, thinking maybe we'd kicked them around on our way out or when we were helping B, but they weren't there. We were about to go check if he had maybe set them outside the door or something when we were shutting it behind us, when T stopped dead in his tracks and whispered my name. I looked over, and in an instant, I knew what had made him stop. The mirror was covered up with the sheet again, only this time the outline of the camera and flashlight could be seen under the cover. We stood there and stared at it for a good minute or two before T got brave enough and started making his way along the wall to get over to the cot. I followed on very shaky legs and I watched as he pulled the cover off the mirror to reveal that his camera and flashlight were indeed hidden under the sheet along with the words help me scrawled in the dust beside them. It was like something out of a horror movie 
and honestly, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it. The nope factor must have been too much for T, because he snatched up his stuff and made a beeline for the door, with me close behind. We slammed the door shut behind us and never went back in. T's mom thought we were making the whole thing up, until we went back and looked through the camera. We had pictures of the cod and the mirror, both before and after messing with them. One of the folded cot with the covered mirror still hidden, one of the open cot with the covered mirror revealed, and one of the uncovered mirror, which showed no writing in the dust. But there was one final picture, which convinced his mom that we were telling the truth, and that she should never open that door again. The last picture was taken seemingly from atop the cot, and clearly showed the giant hole where B had fallen through which meant that after T had put the camera down so that we could get B out of the hole, someone else had picked it up from beside the hole after we left, carried it and a flashlight over to the mirror, and snapped a picture after setting it down. That had to have happened very quickly, because we were only out of the room for three minutes at most. T realized he'd forgotten his camera almost as soon as we'd gotten downstairs. The only ones that were there were T, his mom, myself, and B. His dad and older brother were at work, and even if they had come home, they would have had to pass us on the stairs to get up to the attic. There's just no way that I can logically explain the writing on the mirror, and to this day, I still think about what was in that attic with us. So in 2019, my family and I are driving back from Narrabeen when we drove on Wakehurst Parkway. There's a legend about that road, that a lady in all white is on it, and if you're not careful, she can appear inside your car. So we're driving back at around 9pm, and we're in the thick bush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was all alone. According to my dad, he was driving when he saw a lady, all in white, on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued driving on. But then he saw the same lady, two minutes later, on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady. After we got home, he told us what he had seen, and personally, I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. I went on a trip to Cambodia years ago to visit relatives. I was always a skeptic and a non-believer in anything paranormal. To this day, though, this is the experience that made me a believer. One night, my dad and I decided to stay at my cousin's house. They have a large, multi-level home outside the city of Phnom Penh, in a small village named Svai Rolom. The bedroom I was staying in was upstairs and had its own bathroom, and I was excited to get cleaned up before dinner. As I was in the shower, soap in my hair, I heard somebody call my name. I don't respond right away because surely they can hear that I'm occupied and showering. A second later, I heard my name again, this time slightly louder and closer to the bathroom door. Annoyed, I turned off the water, grabbed a towel, and answered back, yes? When I didn't get a response, I opened the door and looked around the bedroom. The bedroom door was closed and nothing had been moved. I assumed that whoever it was, they must have just left. After I finished my shower, I headed downstairs to the backyard where everybody was, and I asked who had just been looking for me because I heard somebody call my name while I was in the shower. Confused, everybody said that they had all been sitting right where they were, just talking. I brush it off, thinking that maybe I was just exhausted from the day. 
It was a warm night, and there was a full moon out. So we enjoyed our dinner outside. The electricity turns off all throughout the village at a certain time, and it doesn't come back on until morning. So I headed to my room when we had 15 minutes left so that I could get ready for bed. I was exhausted, and I quickly fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to find that I couldn't breathe. I could move, but I couldn't breathe. I was choking for what seemed like a few seconds. Suddenly, I was able to breathe again, and I calmed down. I fell back asleep, only to suddenly wake up choking again. This time, it seemed slightly longer than the last. I panicked and sat up in bed, trying to gasp for air. When my breath finally came back, I stood up and walked around the room, wondering what was going on with me. I had never had an episode like that. I was young, in excellent health. What could it be? After about 30 minutes, I was starting to feel sleepy once more, so I laid down. Once again, I woke up and it was happening all over. I'm gasping for air. I sit up in bed and I still can't breathe. I quickly sprung out of bed and I was still choking. My breath hadn't come back. And just as I thought I was going to pass out, I was able to breathe again. The moonlight was bright and was coming through the window. As I was standing there, catching my breath, I thought I saw a shadow quickly move across the wall in front of me. I sat in bed, and for the first time in a long time, I said a prayer. When I started to feel calmer, I went back to sleep. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. The next morning, I decided not to tell anybody about what had happened the night before. We had a busy day. There was a Buddhist ceremony at the house and a blessing. I was meeting with friends of family and other relatives, and toward the end of the day, I was talking to my older cousin, who's from the United States. She tells me that the monks are there blessing the house because there might be some restless spirits. She went on, giving me an example of the very room that I was staying in that belongs to my other cousin. He refuses to stay in that room at night because he always hears somebody calling his name and pulling at his legs in the night. That was the last night that I stayed in that house. I live outside of Melbourne, Australia. This is the crazy experience that I just had recently. I was outside on my deck having a smoke and I looked up at the sky. Suddenly, two stars appeared directly on top of each other, evenly spaced. Then a third star appeared directly under the second star, again evenly spaced. Another star appeared blinking and moving toward the first star, then went down toward the second, then down to the third, and then away. It was moving very slowly, and each star was blinking in a pattern. I called my partner outside to verify what I saw, and he confirmed that I wasn't crazy and witnessed the moving stars slowly move in patterns that normal craft or satellites couldn't move in. It was going up and down and away and then back at a consistent slow speed. Something clearly had control over it. It was remarkable. We checked again a little bit later and all three stars were gone. I chatted to my housemate about it. Sadly, he was in his room at the time and didn't witness it. He said that my friend and her partner that live about 15 minutes away witnessed the exact same thing months ago. I called my friend and she confirmed that they saw the exact same thing. And then her partner confirmed it as well. They even confirmed the direction they had seen it in from local landmarks and buildings, which completely matched the direction that we had seen it in. So four people have witnessed something similar in a space of like three months in our small town. Super weird.
One night while driving home, I saw a huge bright light, probably a little larger than a full moon, straight ahead of me in the sky. It changed colors from green to yellow, red, blue, and then two other similar lights showed up next to it. They changed colors for about 10 to 15 seconds. Then they all became one big white light and completely disappeared. Then they all came back, changed colors more, and then disappeared for good. I've just never seen anything like this, but I was wondering if anyone else had similar sightings. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted, and it looks like it fits the part. It's old, and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys, and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. A worker there had to let us in, and he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, last night I fell asleep at about one while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. He greeted her, and all she said was, the door is closing now, and continued walking. My cat and I were on the bus, heading up to a takeaway so I could get food for us. The nice lady sells tuna to me for my cat. And I saw multiple figures get onto the bus out of the corner of my eye. My cat even meowed at them. But when I stood up, there was no one around other than the driver. I asked the driver if anybody else had gotten on. And he just kind of shook his head and gave me this worried look. I think he had seen what I had seen, but didn't want to address it. On my walk home that night from the chippy, I saw numerous shadows in the fog, which startled my cat so much that he actually jumped off my shoulder, and I later found him at home. Usually, my cat is really well behaved, so I have no idea, but that night and that night bus were freaky. In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, 
and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. A few years back, my mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousin's, and their kid's house. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, Although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, she suddenly saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three young people. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all as the shops are regular meeting places for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd about these young people. My mom said that they were dressed in the period of the 1970s, when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but nobody was acknowledging them. Their existence was completely overlooked by other people, as if they were invisible. My mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious teenagers had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought maybe they had gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes later, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was how normal these teenagers looked, but the fact that she was the only one that seemed to be able to see them. It's a story she still tells today. A few years ago, I temporarily lived in a cabin out in the woods with my friend due to some unexpected life circumstances. One night, we had another friend over, and all three of us had a smoke session in the backyard at about 3 a.m. That was when we started to hear a strange noise in the woods. It kind of sounded like a humming engine coming closer to us. Suddenly, my friend shouts in confusion as he explains that he briefly got blinded by a distant light. A few seconds later, my other friend notices a flying object near the treetops, about 40 meters away. When he points out that the object is see-through and that you can actually see the outlines of the treetops behind it, we are all just stunned and we just look in awe, in complete silence, until the object spirals away super fast up toward the sky in a manner that is certainly not possible with any known technology we have. Then it disappeared. We rushed inside, and my friend had the brilliant idea to have everybody draw what they had seen simultaneously without looking at each other's to confirm what we saw. We all showed our pictures at the same time, and we all drew the exact same thing. We kicked ourselves over not recording the event for proof, but later realized that all of us had left our phones inside while going out to smoke. We joked about the light scanning us to see if we had any recording devices on us. We all went to bed, with both of them sleeping upstairs, and with myself being downstairs, alone. As I lay down, pondering over the experience and feeling a bit uneasy, I suddenly see two orbs floating around the room. One was red, and one was blue. 
I get a bit freaked out and pretend to be asleep while I watch these orbs float around for about five minutes. Then they disappeared. Eventually, I fell asleep, and when I woke up the next day, I was eager to share my experience. They informed me that when they woke up and went outside, the door handle crumbled in their hands, like all of the components of the door handle had been dismantled. It was a very surreal experience overall. Aliens, advanced technology not known to the public, I don't know, but it certainly gives me this childlike hope that there's more to this life than the dull reality we live in. My family friends lived in a small coastal town in California, and it has really old buildings there, including the original state capitol. They lived in an older house built around the 60s or 70s, and it was a single-story home. I was small, maybe two to four years old, and my parents never let me or my brother go there. My uncle and auntie didn't really let anyone else go there either, because of, well, all of it. It was haunted by a little girl or something. They would see a shadow, ironically the dog's name is Shadow, down the hall, hear a laugh, doors would slam shut or suddenly open, and they would hear footsteps running around. The dog, Shadow, would stare down the hallway and start to growl and bark, and even start to whimper after they found scratch marks on him one time. After this, they didn't want anyone to go to their house, especially not kids. The daughter, who is the same age as I am, came crying to her mom, saying that the little girl with black hair and white threw a toy at her. The oldest brother had his lights flicker, his dog barking and his door slamming shut all the while. It scared the crap out of everyone. But one night, Another one of my uncles had to drive by their house to pick up my uncle and auntie to go to a party. He saw a girl that looked like the daughter crouched on top of the van with her hair over her face, just tapping on the windshield of the car. He called my uncle to ask if their daughter was outside, but he said, nope, all the kids are at their grandparents. But as soon as he got off the phone, it was gone. In the morning, they saw a small handprint on the driver's side window and small scratches on the front windshield and a dead mourning dove on their porch. They moved about five months later. I was 18 and living in a big house in a small village with my mom. We had a large garden with a designated area for our eight rabbits. Every evening, we would take turns to go out to feed the animals before it got dark. However, this particular evening, we had arrived home so late that it was already darker than usual. We agreed to feed the rabbits together because it can be quite creepy out in the garden alone at night. I went to the bathroom and told my mom that I would meet her out there in a minute. When I was done, I went straight to the garden, where I heard my mom call, Jess? As she heard the door close behind me. I answered, yes, and I saw her upper body pop up from behind the trampoline to make sure it was me. There were no lights outside, however, the combination of the moon, stars, and distant low light of the motorway was enough to illuminate the area to be able to see quite clearly. I was only around 10 meters from her, so I could see her face and her very distinct big curly blonde hair. She said, okay, and bent back down behind the trampoline to continue feeding the rabbits. I looked down at the grass as I made my way to the bottom of the garden, so as not to step in any holes dug out by the rabbits during their runaround time. As I made my way down, I spoke to her about how naughty one of the rabbits was acting that day. It took me no longer than seven seconds to get to the rabbit area. As I approached behind the trampoline where the rabbit's hutches were, 
I looked up and expected to see my mom standing there, as I had just seen and spoken to her a few moments before. She wasn't there. I looked around for a few seconds, thinking she might be hiding in order to give me a playful scare, when, to my horror, I heard the back door of the house close. I looked up quickly and saw my mom walking out into the garden. I immediately speed walked up that garden toward her so fast with total terror in my eyes. She asked me what was the matter, and I just said, I'm never going down there again. I just saw you and spoke to you, and by the time I got down there, you were gone. Then you walked out the door. She looked at me wide-eyed and assured me that she had been in the kitchen getting her shoes on the entire time. She's not skeptical at all about these kinds of things, and from the look on my face, she could tell that I had experienced quite a scare, so she believed me straight away. We were both quite nervous about going back down there. However, the rabbits needed feeding, so we had a nervous laugh and cautiously went down to feed the rabbits together. We had a look around, and there was nothing there. I don't know who or what I spoke to in my garden. Maybe it was a glitch in the matrix and my mom from another timeline appeared to feed my rabbits. Or perhaps some darker forces were at work that night. I've read a little bit about doppelgangers and how some people recognize them as warnings of death. I don't know if it's related, but not long after this incident, half the rabbits dropped dead within a few days of each other. I still can't explain what happened. I've always been in tune with the paranormal since I was a little girl. My relatives tell me that I played hide and seek with my great grandfather, two months after his passing. Unbeknownst to me, I was too little to understand death. Besides having contacts with the deceased throughout my life, I've also experienced prophetic dreams multiple times a week, mostly of ordinary events, like dreaming of having a conversation with my mother and then having it play out a couple of weeks later exactly as I dreamed. Some of my other family members also share some particularities. My mother has foreseen pregnancies and cancers, and my cousin always dreams of people before meeting them. I considered all of this somewhat different, but not completely out of the ordinary. I never thought anything of it except having the constant deja vu passing through me like a shockwave from events that play out exactly like in my dreams. Until one day, it all changed. And before I start, I would just like to say that this story is 100% true, and to this day, I don't know the complete truth behind it. In September of 2018, I saw a moth. Nothing unusual, just a regular moth that landed on my desk while I was studying for university. It was the most ordinary moth you could imagine, and I thought nothing of it. Until three days later, when I saw another one. Again, a regular moth with no distinguishable features just happened to enter my room and stay on the wall. And then again, a couple days later, I saw another one land close to me at the university. I would be walking on the street and see moths everywhere. Before September of 2018, I had seen maybe five moths in my entire life. And then all of a sudden, I saw five in one week. If it was only happening in my bedroom, I would assume something logical was going on. But they always seemed to follow me everywhere and land close to me, even at random places like the DMV. After a month of this madness, I had a random conversation with my grandmother about something completely unrelated. That's when she mentioned that her deceased mother-in-law, my great-grandmother, was a witch. Not a regular witch, but black magic type of witch. Now, my grandmother is not completely trustworthy since she does exaggerate absolutely everything she says. It could very well have been that she just had some incense and candles, and my grandmother said she was sacrificing chickens to the devil or something. I was never able to figure out the truth of it, since nobody in my family speaks of it. And the one person that does is not a completely reliable witness. 
But true or not, I started looking into witchcraft and paganism after this conversation, and I came across the symbolism of moths. One of them is spiritual transformation. And then it clicked in my head that maybe, just maybe, someone was trying to reach out to me, to guide me, to get me to research, to tell me that this is what my spiritual path is supposed to be. Maybe it was my great-grandmother trying to hold my hand and steer me in the right direction. Maybe you believe this and maybe you don't. All I know is that after this realization, the moths stopped. I went back to seeing them on a normal, regular basis. And when I do, I always greet them like old friends and I thank them for the message. I just got back from a visit to Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. I stayed at the Best Western next to Cemetery Ridge. My room actually looked out onto the ridge. On the first night, I woke up at about five in the morning and I looked out the window at the hill. It was a clear night without a moon, so the hill was completely dark. All I could see was the outline of the ridge. I stared at the ridge and tree line for about two minutes not really knowing what I was looking for, and just thinking about the battle there. For some reason, I started thinking about what if I saw a ghost or an orb, and at that very moment, a bright round white ball of light came in the tree line at the ridge of the hill. It didn't look like a flashlight since it didn't have a beam or variate in any way as it moved. It was about the size of a softball, I imagine, since it was about 150 yards away. It started moving right to left along the tree line and then sped off across the hill toward the angle. If you know that location on Cemetery Ridge, then you'll know what I mean. The whole thing lasted about 30 to 45 seconds. And as it was happening, I wanted to run over and grab my phone to take a picture or a video, but I didn't want to miss anything. I was also trying to figure out what it was. Once it was gone, there was nothing and nobody on the ridge from what I could see. So I got my phone and recorded for about 10 minutes while watching to see if it came back. Unfortunately, nothing appeared and daylight was starting to break. So I could actually start making out the trees and a few statues and monuments on the ridge. Needless to say, I couldn't get back to sleep. I feel like I should also add that the movement of light from right to left was erratic, and when it sped off, it was extremely fast, leaving a trace of light behind it. In my opinion, nobody could have run that fast, and there was no indication of a motorcycle or a bike or a car anywhere nearby. So, I don't know, but it was cool nonetheless. Approximately five years ago, one of my coworkers, an 18 year old woman at my job, didn't show up for her shift one day. The next time we worked together, I asked why she had called out the other day. We just so happened to be in the presence of one of our supervisors and we were all standing close to the entrance. She told us that her house had flooded because her younger brother left the faucet running right before her family went out to dinner. They came back to the house being mildly flooded. Unfortunate, but not too crazy of a story. The next day at work, the same coworker and same supervisor were standing in the exact same spot as the day prior, close to the entrance and were talking. I asked my coworker how her house and family were doing. She asked me what I was talking about and why I would ask her that. I said, you know, because of your house flooding. She became very visibly upset and bothered and demanded to know how I knew that her house had flooded. I became very confused. I asked her, don't you remember telling me that literally just yesterday? 
She insisted that she didn't tell me about her house flooding and demanded to know how I found out this information. I was bewildered and I was convinced she must be messing with me because she 100% told me and our supervisor about her house flooding. I turned to our supervisor and I'm like, did she not tell us about her house flooding yesterday? Expecting an obvious yes in response. However, our supervisor said she had no idea that her house had flooded either and it was the first time she was hearing about it. I was stunned almost into silence and I'm incoherently babbling trying to explain that she definitely did tell us this. My coworker cuts me off and says, there's absolutely no way you could have known about that. I haven't told anyone about my house flooding aside from our general manager, not even, and inserted the name of another coworker who she was really close with. She said, if I haven't even told her about that, why the F would I tell you? She literally looked at me with disgust and stormed off. At this point, I'm still convinced that it was some kind of elaborate prank. I asked the supervisor who had witnessed it before about the whole thing again, and she still maintained that she was unaware about her house flooding. This disturbed me greatly, but it's just so freaking insane that I was still convinced they had to be messing with me. The next time I worked with flooded house coworker, I said hello to her and she just glared at me in response and walked off. After that day, it was never the same. We worked together for another six months or so, and she continued to avoid me. If we had to interact, she was rude to me and treated me like I was some kind of creepy stalker that was obsessed with her. I swear on my life that she told me about her house flooding. I remember it very vividly, but her reaction to me knowing was so intense and so prolonged, I really don't think she was faking that. My supervisor also maintained that she never actually told us about it. I even talked to her best friend about it, who also said that she had not previously known about the house flooding. Her best friend told me that it was best to just leave the topic alone and to leave flooded house girl alone. I have no explanation for this, and when I tell people about the situation, they either tell me I'm crazy or making it up. I don't know how to explain it. I don't even believe in parallel universes, but I don't know what else it could be. Other than a switch up in the timelines or something. I don't know. It haunts me though. I think about it all the time and it just makes me feel sick. I started going to a new school in the second grade. The cafeteria was downstairs in the basement, and then there was a long, empty hallway that led to the two bathrooms. I remember the first time I went to the bathroom there. Nobody told me it was haunted, so on the first day of second grade, I ventured down the hall to go to the bathroom. As I made my way toward it, I kept hearing this noise. It was like, ooh, ooh over and over. When I approached the doorway, so much negative energy hit me that I knew not to go in there. I ran back to the cafeteria, told some girls about it, and they were like, oh yeah, it's haunted. We were all terrified of this bathroom. The boys said that their bathroom was fine, but that the girls' bathroom down there also freaked them out, even to be near it. It got so bad that we had to have the principal come and talk to our class about it. Everyone knew it was haunted. Flash forward to third grade. It was Halloween and I was the first student in the classroom. Every Halloween, we had a parade outside where we would all march around in our costumes. I began putting my costume on over my clothes and I noticed a piece of paper folded up on my desk. It caught my eye. I don't know how to describe it, but it was folded strangely. I picked it up, unfolded it, and in a faint handwriting was, if you dare go to the bathrooms downstairs, I'll kill you. I can't make this up. 
I was the first student in the classroom. The previous day, I had left school in line with everyone else. Once more kids came into the classroom, I told my friends and they were more scared than I was. They made me tell the teacher. You could tell that she thought it was odd, but she crumpled up the paper and threw it away. And that's the last time I saw it. I went in the bathroom again, but only in large groups. We used to have a thing called field day where we played outside all day at the end of the school year. One day on a field day, about 10 other girls and I had to go to the bathroom. So we all teamed up and went to the one downstairs. I remember leaning up against the wall and feeling and hearing something. It was like somebody was banging on the wall with an ax. We all heard it and it was uncomfortably loud. I also have to add that no one ever went into the last stall, but this day a girl did. I mean, it had cobwebs all over it and everything. Literally nobody would use it. Then one night I was at the school for a concert. This was toward the end of fifth grade, so I was brave enough to go there by myself. I was kind of curious. I went down to the hall and as usual, that Ooh, sound could be heard a mile away. I went into the bathroom, but I just kind of stood around. I didn't actually go into a stall or anything. Suddenly, I just got scared and I ran toward the door, but I was rather surprised when I bumped into a strange lady with long gray hair, a scarf partially covering her head and face. I just brushed by her and ran. Also, the lights have turned off when I was in that bathroom. The energy in there is just insane. You just feel in danger. Girls would cry and sob because they didn't want to have to use that bathroom. The loud, overwhelming sound and the occasional banging noises, that unused last stall, the scratches on the mirror, the old poster on the wall, all of it was just creepy. That note might have been a prank but that bathroom is haunted. So I'm currently 16 and this happened when I was three. I'm from New Zealand. We have this RNZAF Air Force base called Ohakia. Apparently, a lot of really mysterious things happen around Air Force bases, so I'm not sure if this is common or what. But it may be 2.30 in the morning. My dad and mom and I are in the car driving back from Wellington. I have family there. And we're maybe 10 seconds past the base of this tree. Well, it's a tree-like thing. Those big, tall bush tree things that farms use for privacy. All of a sudden, there's a light slowly moving along the tree line. My dad thought it could have been a farmer out trimming hedges, but my mom says, not at nearly three in the morning. So we pull off to this rest area and watch this light. It's completely stopped moving and it's just spinning when another light joins it and spins in a counterclockwise triangle. Maybe two minutes later, another comes from literally thin air and joins the triangle, now having three points, and they just spin and spin and spin. Then they stop, then they start again. After about five minutes, which seems like 10 years, they stop again and stay still for maybe five seconds. Then one flies straight up into the sky and disappears at warp speed. The other two lights just keep spinning when another flies off to the right and disappears. So now it's back to just one light spinning, it starts to move along the tree line again, and then it just flies off to the left and disappears also, never to be seen again. All this started and ended within 15 minutes. After that, we just drove back, but we're all looking around, amazed and terrified. To this day, we've never seen anything else like it.
I was working a part-time job at a church at the time of this event, and it was at the end of the day, so I was cleaning up and getting ready to lock it up for the day. For context, this church is very old, and there are graves on the property that date from the 1860s. The place has burned down twice. I go to the church's kitchen to grab my lunch bag from the fridge, and when I walk through the door, out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman at the counter to my right. I thought it was my boss, but the fridge was straight ahead, so I walked forward and grabbed my stuff. I turned around, and there was no one there. I was alone in the kitchen, and the door didn't open, but there was someone there. I made a conscious effort not to look, because I'm kind of socially awkward. I thought about it and realized, wait, that woman was wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern on it. How on earth could that have been my boss? She only ever wears jeans and sweaters. I kind of freaked out, and I went inside and locked up the church, and I told my friend about it who's been going to the church for a long time. I didn't tell him what she was wearing, just that I had seen a woman that I didn't recognize. He told me that people like to joke about the church being haunted, but that there was no way I saw a ghost in broad daylight like that. It was the light, playing tricks on me. Sure. After my job was done, I forgot all about the interaction, until I got a text from my friend. It said, Bro, was that woman you saw working at the counter wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern? I never described the clothing to him. So we both saw the same woman in the kitchen cooking. Our theory is that back in the day, the women would do all the work in the kitchen for church services. She must have been buried on the church grounds and she was just there, working in the kitchen for decades or even a century, continuing on with the work she had always done. I was 10 years old. My brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, stuff like that. Anyway, about a mile away from my house, I look out the window and I see an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it because a day or so before that, a bunch of kids and I at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it, thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house, and wasn't about to think another thing of it. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally just shrunk before my eyes into a tiny, shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky. Except it wasn't a star. It was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even farther into the sky, shot down to its original height, and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. When I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling about the end times. My mother said that I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad, because my mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me that when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which by the way was only a few miles away from our house. They saw an orange football shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father is skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff, ever. But when I shared my story, he paused and said that it was very odd to have seen the exact same thing behave the exact same way more than 30 years apart. I 
I've had many paranormal experiences in my life, but this one has stuck with me for a while. This all happened a few years ago in a little hick town. My friends and I were bored as hell, so we decided to find some trouble to get into. My friend mentioned a super creepy house in the middle of nowhere that had been sitting empty for a little over a year. We decided that since we didn't have anything better to do, we should go and check it out. So the six of us crammed into a car and headed over there. It was around 3 a.m., middle of summer. The moon was full and it lit up everything around us. We parked a little ways up the road and walked up to the house. It was definitely spooky in the moonlight. It kind of looked like the creepy house from the Blair Witch Project. We were originally just going to walk around the property, but my boyfriend at the time decided to kick the door open and explore inside. Three of my friends stayed outside to watch for cops. The cops didn't normally patrol the area, but we wanted to be extra safe. The other two and I went inside. I made it maybe six feet into that house before I got hit with a really weird, heavy feeling. It felt like I was wrapped up in a thick blanket, but instead of being warm and cozy, it was cold. I got out of there as fast as I could. My boyfriend and our friend, let's call him Tim, teased me, saying that I was being a wimp. I knew something was weird in that house, and I refused to go back in. Tim decided to record their walk through the house. After walking through, Tim picked something up, threw it at my boyfriend, and started screaming to try to spook him. Well, it worked, and they ran out. The three of us then started looking through a shed in the back. We found various hunting traps. They looked pretty old and rusted, so I assumed they were just hung up for decoration. My boyfriend decided to take one to remember that night. I'm pretty sure that the trap he stole had something attached to it. A lot of weird stuff started happening at our place after that, but those are stories for another time. We left shortly after. When we got back, we watched the video that Tim took inside the house. After we laughed at my boyfriend's screams, Tim said he thought he had heard something weird in the video. So we played it back. And sure enough, while they're running out of the house, there's a voice in the video that doesn't belong to either of them. It was a woman's voice, clearly saying, she died here. We collectively lost our minds. I was the only girl there that night, and the sound of them screaming and running would have drowned out my talking. And like I said, I had already left. I wish I still had the video for proof, but I had a falling out with Tim and deleted our messages, so I don't have the video anymore. I still beat myself up over not saving it. I used to be terrified of the paranormal, so I didn't save it when he first sent it to me. I've come to accept since then that I'll always have weird paranormal experiences, and it'll always be a part of my life. Still, that video was the first paranormal experience I've ever had solid evidence of. When my dad was little, he used to spend a lot of time at his grandmother's. She lived up in the mountains, and she was one of those people who just took care of everyone. He said that he lost count of all the times that drunks or people on drugs would come in at all hours of the night, and she would always feed them, let them rest, and then send them on their way. She was a kind person, but also one who, what you see, is what you get and she wasn't afraid to tell you what was on her mind. He said that he grew up not being scared of much because of her, and he thought the world of her. But there was one event that happened to him in the woods that scares him to this day. It's one of the reasons that he barely hunts or scouts alone, if he can help it. He was about 17 or 18, and he had stayed with his grandmother so that he could go deer scouting the next morning. The next day, he gets up early and heads out. My dad has a good sense of direction, but for some reason that day, 
He got turned around and lost in the dense forests of the mountains. He walked and walked, and night fell, with him still clueless on whereabouts he was. Tired, frustrated, and a little uneasy, he stopped to take a break and sat down. He said that it was just pitch dark, so much so that his little flashlight didn't give him much light at all. He was thirsty and starving, and he just wanted to get back to his grandmother's. As he sat there, thinking about where to go, he heard heavy footsteps and twigs snapping behind him. This scared him at first, thinking that he might have come across a bear. He stood up, knowing that if it was, he needed to get the hell out of there, but to not be hasty about it, so as to spook it. He just starts calmly walking away, hoping that he was going in the right direction this time. But the footsteps followed him. They were extremely heavy, thudding behind him a distance away. But as he walked, he noticed that they were speeding up. My dad starts walking faster, and as you can guess, the footsteps become faster. In a short time, he hears them now maybe a couple of yards behind him. Scared out of his mind, he turns around and shines his little flashlight to see nothing except these huge hoof prints. In their wake, the grass was dead and everything around it was dying with each step. He starts freaking out and straight out sprints, not caring which way he's going. He just wants to get as far away from whatever that is as possible. The footsteps behind him are following suit, sprinting after him. He only glances back once more, still seeing nothing but giant hoof prints and dead grass, leaves, and things like that wherever they had landed. By now he's not sure how long or how far he's been running when he sees lights in the distance. He runs toward them, hoping that somebody can help him if he's come upon a house or a store. He breaks out of the woods and joy floods over him when he sees that it's his grandmother's home. She's sitting on the porch, the lights outside are on. His grandmother was a religious woman, so she was reading her Bible at the time. It's embarrassing for him to admit now, but he said that he started screaming for her, tears falling down his cheeks, and she stands up and looks behind him. That's when she sees the hoof prints and hears the sounds herself. She holds her hand out to him and he grabs onto it tightly. She pulls him to her and then says loudly, you can't have him. He said that the silence that lingered after that was intense. He had buried his head into her shoulder, so when he looked up, all he could see were the hoof prints and the dead grass and leaves. She just held on to him as he cried, whispering to him that he was okay and that it was gone. He has no idea what was after him that night, and he doesn't want to know, but he's pretty sure that his grandmother saved his life that night. So I moved into this house and I've been here for about a year now, but about a month ago, weird things started happening. Like I said, my family and I moved into this house a year ago after we had worked on it for about five months. After we finished, we moved in to the basically new house. We had torn everything up, replaced cabinets, and even gotten new plumbing installed. After we moved in, it was a relief we had finally gotten out of the moving process. We invite all of our family over for Christmas, one aunt and one grandma. But after Christmas passed, my aunt would frequently ask us how the house was doing, how we were doing, and how our dog was doing. We didn't really find this odd at first. I mean, she's family, and we just moved. So we just figured she was curious as to how we were all doing. But then, I started hearing the footsteps in the attic. Soft, but definitely noticeable. Since I have a tree that's taller than the house, right outside the window, I just thought it was that. 
After a while, I got annoyed, and I wondered if it was just really windy at night here. I go outside to see how windy it is. Not even a breeze. So then I look into the attic with a flashlight to see if my mom was up there doing something, but nobody was there. I didn't see anybody. But what I did see was a set of footprints in the dust of the attic floor. And the floor was still creaking as I was up there. I was confused and wondering if maybe the house was just shifting. I went up to where I could see the footprints more clearly. I was just super confused. They were bigger footprints than mine. I'm a 12 in men's. So I go back into my room and the footsteps are still going back and forth, back and forth. I fall asleep after a while, but I never forget it. Fast forward about three weeks of this happening. I finally talk to my mother about it. She went up and looked with me and the footprints were still in the dust. Moved to yesterday. I was talking to my aunt and I told her about it. She asked if anything else had happened and I said no. She's very religious for context. She asks if the footprints were bigger than mine and I said yes. She asks if they happened over my room every night and I said yes. Then she asks if I've put salt in the surrounding area of the attic to prevent whatever was causing all the noise, and I say no. She says, be not afraid, and hangs up. Convinced that my aunt cursed me or something, I guess I'm telling my story to figure out what could have happened. Either she perceived something early on and just didn't want to scare us, or she did something. I'm leaning toward the former, but I just don't know what is happening up there. I grew up in Monroe, Washington, about 45 minutes northeast of Seattle. Small, quiet town with mostly woods and forests around it. I grew up and my mom and cousins used to always tell me a story about a man they called the grocery bag man. The name is exactly what it sounds like. A creepy man in a trench coat, always carrying around one bag in each hand. This wouldn't be scary except for the fact that all of our houses were spread pretty deep in the backwoods, miles from downtown where you would get groceries. Every single one of my family members would see him around their respective homes, usually early in the mornings. I never believed in this guy. I thought it was a joke. When I turned 16 and I could drive, I would always spend time with friends in and around the backwoods of Monroe. One night, I was driving to my friend's house who lives about 10 miles out of town in a deeply secluded area. It's hilly. There are no sidewalks and you never see people out. In order to get to this house, you had to drive into town from my house and then back up another back road. As I drove down around 11 o'clock at night, I finally see grocery bag man. One bag in each hand, trench coat, long and creepy disheveled hair. When I passed him, I swear he stared straight into my soul. I speed to my buddy's house for a little party and I'm telling my friends about what I saw and the story that my family used to tell me. Of course, I'm being made fun of because nobody believes me. I eventually say, screw it, and stop trying to prove to them that there's this creepy dude haunting the old roads. At about two o'clock in the morning, we decide to drive into town to get some jack-in-the-box food as high school boys tend to do. We all pile into my buddy's truck and start driving out of his neighborhood development. As we hit the stop sign to turn onto the main roads, I kid you not, grocery bag man slowly walks past our car and continues down into the abyss. Needless to say, they weren't making fun of me anymore.
Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around 7 or 8 at night. My father picked me up at the airport, and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away, and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color, and had... Well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of, like, ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular, ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle, and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large, and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white, all at the same time. And yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam. And when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which, if you've ever driven down I-95, is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect, I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving, and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split, for a few moments it kept pace with the car. Then each half, while still on its side, shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. For some background, whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty much alone on bus rides. I was always on one of those small buses. We didn't have any other kids on there, but the highest amount of kids on the bus was probably around five, including me. I was the only one from my school on that bus. All of the other kids went to the same school, and it wasn't mine. Plus, I've had about four different bus drivers in my time. The one I'm going to talk about lost her husband about a year before, and she was out for a long time. She had just gotten back when this took place. This happened about four or five years ago, and I was still pretty young. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids, and we were heading to my school. We were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused. I thought maybe the bus had broken down, but being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything. I just waited. Then the bus driver opened the door. I started to feel a bit uneasy. We weren't at my school yet, and there was nobody there, so why was she opening it? She stared out the door for like two minutes when I finally said, are you okay? I asked, without looking away from the door, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills, there's a man there. 
There was no man there. No person at all. She kept staring for a couple of seconds, when she finally closed the door and continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year, and I do miss her. She was a very sweet lady. But that moment still freaks me out. I sometimes think that maybe the man she saw was her husband. I don't know who else she would open a school bus door to. I don't know why she would stop the bus in the first place, especially for a stranger. Maybe she saw her husband, and it wasn't until after the door was open that she realized he was dead and that's why she stared. I don't really know what happened that day, but I'll never forget it. I was an EMT and then a paramedic for eight years before becoming a registered nurse. It was a decent sized city, 100,000 plus citizens, and loads of weird history. I had a lot of things happen, but this is the story that I will never forget. There was one house that we would go to pretty regularly that was beyond haunted. I don't know who or what lived and died in there before the then present patient. There were mannequins in the living room, several. I never asked because I didn't want to be in there any longer than necessary. The first time we were called there, I stood on the stoop trying to will my body to go in. The atmosphere in there was intimidating. It almost felt like the house was saying, come in if you dare. My partner was male, so I thought, meh, we'll be fine. I'm a five foot four female, and I can hold my own in a bar fight. Threatening presences I cannot see are another story. We get to our patient, and as I'm hooking up the EKG, someone backed into me, knocking me off the balls of my feet. I was squatting next to the couch. I tell my partner to back up, and he says, from what? I look up and he's on the other side of the room, nowhere near me or the couch. So I turn around. There's nothing there, but I'm eyeballing these mannequins up against the wall, a good 15 to 20 feet away. I shake it off and go back to what I'm doing, and again I'm knocked over. I tell my partner to knock it off, but now he isn't even in the room. He wandered to the kitchen to gather the patient's medications. Now I'm on my feet. There's no way that this happened twice from nothing. I turn back to these mannequins again. One has shifted slightly away from the wall, now standing with a shoulder to it, when before its back was against it. I asked the patient a bit too late if anyone else was in the home. Scene safety should have been first, but yeah, oops. She said no, it was just her and the cat. Thinking this cat must be a puma or something, I start to look for it. Unfortunately, Peanut was no bigger than my American size 7 foot. I had only ventured to the hallway, maybe 10 feet from the couch, but out of view of the mannequins. When I walked back into the living room, that mannequin was now facing me. Every hair on my body stood up. Not today, Satan. We packaged her up got her in the truck for transport, and got away from that tiny house. Lo and behold, dispatch sends a request to my tablet for an explanation of a long scene time. I had to put harassed by mannequins in a run ticket without looking like I needed to be on a 72-hour hold. We went back to that house three more times that month. I called from the door for her to come to me. I'm not that stupid. I will never go in there again unless I absolutely have to. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. 
I have epilepsy, so I'm never sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I've never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived at his late grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a little drably dressed old man, about one and a half feet tall, run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I'd already been through, when he asked me what happened, I just told him I'd slipped. Another thing I once saw may have been a troll, but I'm not sure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you can enlighten me. I had been doing a lot of meditating, three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was this three and a half to four foot, naked, wrinkly, elf-type troll thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I've had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I have seen them as well. Once in childhood, I had an encounter with my late Noni and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways and nothing has ever been found other than some white spots from chronic migraines, and those popped up super recently. I've also been evaluated by a neuropsychologist, and nothing other than my seizures, due to the head trauma, has ever been wrong with me. Like I said, the head trauma happened way after I saw the troll or gnome or whatever it was. I don't know what these things are, but what do you think? Tonight, August 4th of 2019, at around 10.15, my aunt and I were on the porch when my aunt saw something in the sky. It was like an outline of a circle, and part of it was gone, kind of like how an eclipsed moon would look at first. We noted that this was not where the moon usually is. Usually it's behind our house. So eclipse and moon were ruled out. The thing was bright yellow, and had an orange-red tint to it. It almost looked like a fireball. It's night, and the sun is on the other side of the planet at this minute, so wasn't that either. We thought it was a shooting star at first, but it wasn't moving anywhere. It started, like, flattening out, like spreading. Then it started to shrink into a smaller form. It kind of looked like a star. Then all of a sudden, it disappeared. A few minutes later, it suddenly reappeared and got bigger and bigger. It looked as if the moon would have been over the sun and coming off of it, moving toward the way it came in the first time. The light around it kind of spread out again. Then suddenly, it started getting smaller, like the dark part of the eclipse was going back over. Then it split into two and completely disappeared. We waited to see if it would come back but it didn't come back for the third time. I started doing some research and found nothing for solar or lunar eclipses that described what we saw. No meteor showers, no eclipses even happened in our area, no comets, nothing of the sort for that night. After doing some more searching, two other people saw almost the same thing three days ago around the same time. My aunt stepped back outside and called me over, fast. There was what looked to be a pretty low plane flying with two large wings. My aunt says it looked like it had four wings, two on either side, and I'm telling you this thing was big. One side was bright red, 
and the other was bright green. Planes in our area normally have a small light that flickers on both sides. It wasn't like this at all. This plane was coming from the same area that we had seen these mystery light things in. And when the plane got behind our house, I ran to look at it and I couldn't see it at all. It was big, like I said. It shouldn't have been out of view already. My aunt and I have been trying to come up with a logical explanation, but nothing makes any sense. I don't want to claim aliens, but I don't know what else it could have been.